Salutations everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, and thank you for joining me here in Tier Nova, the last season of Europe, in which we're checking out the Chelyabinsk Institute. The Institute is an organization considered by many to be enigmatic, elitist, and shadowy. Indeed, by survivors of Magnitogorsk, it may be considered the second coming of Lysenko, a cabal of technocrats, visionaries, and scientists that rules over a city with the assistance of other loyal security forces. However, this is not true in the slightest. In reality, the Institute is a benevolent institution, run as the last enclave of science and vision within Russia, founded by the combined efforts of ultra-visionary refugees, saner scientists from the Black Mountain, and intellectuals that have fled from all over Russia. In their isolated city, the Institute seeks to build a small enclave of reason in the wasteland of madness, and will put all their talents to work in the defense of their new home. And of course, we are led by Nikolai Gardashev. Very cool. If you'd like to read by him, please go right ahead, but the star shines on. Nikolai Kardashev lifted his head from the paperwork he had been working through all night, though through the full-length window, which replaced one of the walls of his office, countless dots of sparkling and shining lights contrasted against a dark pitch and onyx black tapestry of space. Even in the unending nightmare which was now Russia, some things, like the enigmatic sky, would always stay constant. Where the factories and apartment blocks littering the Siberian municipality would once years ago shunned with industrial floodlights late into the darkest hours of the night. There was no utter darkness. That nighttime glow and buzz what was had previously eclipsed the stars above. It was only with their extinguishing that he could see their radiance. The city and perfectly many others had been cut off from the power grid for weeks as the nation fell into utter chaos. Hunger and poverty was everywhere, even more so than that mad under that madman Tabritsky's empire. And there was not enough food or even water to go around with Chilobinsk or Russia ever healed from the three injuries that she had been afflicted with, the two great patriotic wars, and now the lunatic's rule. Yet in spite of the crushing sorrow and despair all around him, Kardashev stayed hopeful, like the stars he glimpsed. There were those things which he would be eternal and unchanging. The days of dictators and tyrants, of tabarite skites, and uh, dudes, would eventually pass with time, and Russia would rebuild what was left of herself. They always did, and they will again. Through it all, it would be science, knowledge, enlightenment, and all the good virtues of truth which would prevail without fail. Its survival here in Chelyabinsk was the strongest proof he could have asked for. He merely hoped his own efforts would not be wasted. Hope still survives with the National Spirit's attrition preparations. Very cool. I like that a lot. The carrot and the stick. Ooh, the Dovenga Brigade. We also have a visionary enclave. Enclave here. The cutting edge. Nice. Even though it does hurt your supply consumption, but plus 50% more defense is very strong. I like that a lot. And we got some technology we can do for the little nation here. Cool. Basic fire control systems for ships? Why not? Building the base. How many days rations do we have left in case our deliveries cease? The minister shuffled through the stack of documents in front of him. Uh, we're not sure. Any new findings on the equipment Daddy Tabby left us? Uh, not much. We. And how about the refugees coming from the west? How many are there and where are, where are they being kept? We don't have enough data on that either. Gardashev's head throbbed with a migraine as he considered the information his ministers had presented to him more and more aptly. The absence of information which they had, uh, had informed him of. He knew that the path through building a utopia would be a rocky one, one filled with countless obstacles and hurdles, and whose diverging paths would be fogged and unclear, but there would at least be some direction to his labors. Well, that any solid information of what was actually going on in Chelyabinsk, even how the road should begin, was unknown. Gardashev, after all was devoted to science. He was a career physicist, and what did science value most? Data. Without it, what could he and his ministers know for certain? Without it, how could even how could even the most simple jobs be performed optimally? How could he even know whether their policies were actually working as intended or delivering results? He dismissed the council, telling them once more to brainstorm ways to accrue data, and reminding them of the importance of the first task of the Institute yet. In everyone's minds there, dread had settled. Dread of not being able to live up to their dreams, of failing to make something better out of the ruins of old Russia, and of leaving the sick and tired to their darn fates. Hope still survives, but it is bleak, as academic base, research facilities, agriculture, and industrial equipment are all improving, while Arctic professionalism, nuclear stockpiles, and industrial expertise are not, and poverty is getting a little bit worse here in Chelyabinsk. Not good, but for the future. The conference had been called by Comrade Kardashev to discuss the direction of the newly founded Chelyabinsk Institute it should follow, as well as the needs of the citizens of the city. Amongst these assembled were formerly seasoned politicians and officials from the local government of Chelyabinsk prior to the conquest of West Siberia, the handful of competent bureaucrats and administrators still left in the area, and Kardashev's kindred scientists and experts. The debate would begin with a hunger crisis. With a black void of data they had, it was difficult to properly formulate a response. No one really knew what the people were going through and how severe the shortages were. 
or how many people were affected by them. The conclusion of the conference was that the crisis was very severe if only taking into account official importation of food. That was reported at the border, but was realistically less severe, a statement which in no no way could give any information on the actual availability of food for the average citizen. Then there was a matter of allocating other resources, goods not required for survival but greatly important to the functioning of modern societies such as gas for heating and electricity. Those needs, however, came not just from the citizens, but also from the industry and commercial entities, as well as the government. How were they to be distributed again? Lack of information was a critical issue, as the committee didn't know what areas were severely lacking in said resources, or, nor agreed on what needed it most. For instance, Kardashev's scientists, cliques, were fond of using calculations and planning to allocate resources to the mathematically most important channels, for instance, industry for production of other important goods, perhaps at the expense of the commercial sector or some parts of the population. In the end, the conference only solidified the need for a thorough census and survey to gather information, resulting in little actual change in policy or opinion amongst the governing committees of the Institute. Reality is often disappointing. We have equal rights here, women in the workplace looks like, we have outlawed stuff, penal labor, public education, no, sa no safety or health care uh, stuff here. Um, what is this? Uh, if you want to read about this, it looks like a thing for Lysenko. There can be no dissent, our cause demands it. Very cool. Elite taxation. Oh, oh no, at least tax exemptions. No minimum wage, but giving us oh, give us a future. Dmitri had welcomed Kardashev in the Institute when they announced an end to Daddy Tabby's mad and tyrannical rule over Chelyabinsk and the establishment of a new civilian government. His brother had died to the Taborite chambers of the Empire, and he had only nearly escaped the grit of or the grip of the region's government through wit and sheer luck. Though they seemed a little out of touch and idealistic, Dimitri didn't care as long as he wasn't hunted down for minor infractions or gas for being distantly related to a Freemason. They promised to rebuild the city to provide for its peoples and to establish a new society. And who could disagree with that after years of suffering and anguish? Yeah, it was all good. Too good to be true. His initial impression of the scientist, clique, being elitist and aloof turned out to be corrupt. It had been months since they took over the city, but basic access to good food and water was still rare in his neighborhood. While officials proclaimed that progress was being made and sprouted on and on on the same rubbish about sacrifice, if any change was happening, he definitely wasn't seeing it. Give us bread. Certainly. Neither were the thousands who were marching with him in protest to petition the government to allocate more food, medicine, and gas to the needy. He was one of the luckier ones. He wasn't malnourished or ill, as many others in the crowd were, but he had seen his neighbors and relatives struggle to get by. That was why he chose to take action and join the protests organized by workers who had been disgruntled with shortage after shortage. He had had his own fair share of starvation during the reign of Tabriski, and had only recently been able to have real meals again. Others had not been so fortunate, though, and their pain had not been soothed by Kardashev's taking power. What is with them? Two-year draft, some combat roles, uh, no draft exemptions, integrated military, pretty good. One-party state, state atheism, oh. The whole, the, oh, oh, that is, what are they doing over there? But fatal error. Falsely opening the door to the cabinet room, Kadoshev was greeted by his knights of the round table, his ministers and advisors taking his seat at the front. One member, in charge of security for the institute, cleared his throat. So, comrade Kardashev, I assume you have called us here for... He waved his hand at the window, gesturing vaguely at the masses outside for that. Yes, yes, what's all the commotion about? They've gotten far more militant today, and my secretary told me they tried to break in. An awkward silence cast itself across the room. The security minister finally piped up after several long minutes, or moments. It has to do with the last night. He nodded at the other two representatives of the security force in the room. To give you the long and short of it, admits the tensions in the protest yesterday, a few of her men got spooked and opened live fire. Six confirmed dead as of right now, but and three others eventually severely injured as a direct or indirect result of their actions. The room was silent, stunned for a moment before it broke out into frenzied discussion and whispers between members next to each other. One advisor and esteemed scientist spoke up, his face blanched. This will be a PR disaster for us, comrade Kardashev, if what Smolyakov is saying is true. PR disaster? Are you hearing yourself? We have the blood of six peoples on our hands. I understand that this is a tragedy, comrade, but we must. But on what? Can you think of anything other than a reputation of control for once you raged? The point of the Institute was to help the people to build a society based not only on material truth, but on the needs of the many. But if that is how we're going to treat our citizens, I don't see how we can live up to that. Is the dream dead, my friends? But, oh, well, Lasico still lives. Look at that. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below if you haven't already, and I'll see you tomorrow in another video. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.